So uh, may maybe the topic of this roundtable is uh, big data on longevity. It's a quite huge uh, topic, and um, maybe um, uh, it can be it may be understood uh, of um, in at least two ways. Uh, first, I'm an actuary, I'm a statistician, so the first uh, comprehension uh, uh, of this uh, uh, subject uh, would be um, how can a large amount of, uh, of data be, be used to, to produce better longevity projections uh, models. That is a, 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 a big uh, subject of this uh, conference, important topic of this conference. Uh, in the uh, uh, goal to, to assess uh, what insurers call lo longevity risk. Um, but uh, there is a, a second way of um, understanding the subject of the conference, uh, which is um, can big data lead uh, to dramatic improvements of uh, uh, longevity, of uh, lifespan, uh, of human life duration, uh, because of the me medical uh, advances it can, uh, it can induce. So we d will try, uh, I think, uh, to be more focused on the, the second, uh, second topics uh, today, uh, but maybe we can also talk about uh, the, the, the first one. Um, when, when I, <coughs> I prepare this, uh, uh, this round table, I take a look around uh, what is going on about um, uh, medical or health use of uh, big data and uh, there are many, many uh, things uh, going on. For example, uh, Google recently creates uh, Calico, Calico uh, who seems to, to want to use uh, big data techniques to to uh, longevity and uh, purpose. Uh, Greg Venter, a uh, 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 biology uh, uh, specialist to create human longevity, uh, which seems also want to use big data. Uh, so uh, can uh, such, uh, such initiatives uh, lead to, to, to significant, significant impact of uh, about longevity? Mm. There are many things that uh, may us think that uh, it will be the relevance. So the answer will be will be positive. Um, for example, uh, there are many works about uh, comparison of life trajectories to find uh, to understand why people can uh, ride bicycle uh, age hundred and uh, other uh, cannot. Um, beyond the statistic lifestyles, uh, biology uh, has. Um, um, Digitalized uh, last year, and the petabytes of uh, amount of data, uh, are of uh, omics data, as we can say, uh, are uh, about patients uh, are available. Uh, that leads to precision medicine. Alexander will talk about it in a in a few minutes. Um, in the U.S., you have also the use of uh, connected uh, objects. And can, for example, measure um, more than 100 uh, blood uh, parameters to to um, uh, examine your, your your health state, to monitor your your health state in a non-intrusive way. Um, and then you have also uh, also some some tries to to make um, automatic researchers that is uh, used of. Uh, non parmical statistical techniques uh, to, to analyze uh, health scientific publications and uh, to, to, to find solutions um, or, or amount uh, or <coughs> with this uh, plenty of publications, many, many publications are, are uh, published. So, so, so uh, there was a project called uh, the Enigma Project uh, uh, that tried to, to do that, but uh, I think it is uh, abandoned uh, today because it was uh, judged as too, too complex uh, for them at the moment. So, um, um, with a point of view of uh, insurers and uh, passion plants, uh, the, the question that arises is maybe to uh, how to integrate uh, all these elements in the assessment of the uh, longevity risk and how can they protect themselves against uh, sudden changes of, uh, of uh, longevity. And uh, for example, uh, 
uh, maybe should insurers invest in uh, uh, the longevity business, uh, which is uh, negatively correlated with their uh, annuity uh, business. Uh, but uh, when I say that, I'm staying in uh, some some classical framework. Uh, m m maybe if we can uh, expect such uh, important change that they, they may require um, uh, deeper changes in, uh, in an improvement to on the social and, uh, and economic organization. And uh, we will try, I think, to, to discuss this, uh, this point uh, today. So um, maybe um, you can present yourself uh, in 30 seconds each, and, and then Alexander will uh, make the presentation. Uh, I'm Olivier Cabrignac. I'm a deputy manager uh, for France and uh, Africa uh, in Score Global Life. Uh, so I'm an actuary, a statistician. Uh, I'm always uh, very interested by, by the longevity issues and the mortality issues. So uh, I will try to, to discuss some practitioner uh, point of view regarding the big data and how we can handle uh, a large amount of data uh, in, in the pricing, the reserving, and how we can handle that. Bonjour, euh, donc, euh, je m'appelle Laura Lange, je suis consultante euh, philosophe en organisation, euh, c'est-à-dire que j'utilise la philosophie pour essayer de penser euh, les problématiques professionnelles différemment. Hello everyone, I'm Laura Lange, now I'm a consultant philosopher on organizations, which by which I mean uh, that I use philosophy uh, to help organizations better understand their processes. Um, all right, 20 minutes. Uh, I'll try to do it fast. Uh, my name is Alex Javrankov. I'm the CEO of uh, this company called Insolico Medicine. I'm also the Chief Science Officer of the Biogerontology Research Foundation uh, in the UK. It's a great honor for me to uh, speak at the same conference with uh, such uh, you know, fathers of industries like uh, um, whole fields like uh, Ronald Lee, Tom Kirkwood, that's, uh, and many others. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about two aspects of uh, my research. Uh, one part is related to genomics research and primarily transcriptomic research. Uh, and um, big data analytics uh, in text mining, biomedical grants, uh, publications, and clinical trials. So I'll try to do it fast. I've got 60 slides. So <laughs> um, uh, we're located at Johns Hopkins University. This is my email. You can uh, follow up with me later on. Uh, so don't get slide sick. Uh, I try to cut it down as uh, much as possible. So uh, what our company does is essentially big data analytics. We work on uh, uh, gene expression level. Uh, I'll talk ab uh, briefly about that. And uh, we manage to normalize and harmonize uh, massive publicly available and uh, private databases of uh, transcriptomic data linked to uh, drugs, clinical trials, uh, and uh, a lot of other semantic information about uh, um, a certain condition on a tissue-specific level, an organ-specific level. Uh, we are pathway activation uh, uh, specialists, so we developed our own algorithms for signaling pathway activation. I'm going to talk about that too. Have a massive uh, drug database, 1.3 million uh, drugs in the database, 40,000 linked to uh, gene expression data. Uh, we went into deep learning. How many of you are familiar with the concept? Uh, can you raise your hand if you know what deep learning is? Okay, great. So uh, it's going to be an interesting field. I highly recommend you look at that in the actuarial profession. Um, and we are in already in personalized medicine and drug repurposing. So that's our business model. We have many international collaboration, but uh, with a mission to combat aging. So we have uh, 33 bioinformatics uh, people worldwide uh, at Hopkins, uh, Poland, China, Germany, UK, and uh, Russia. Um, this is our scientific advisory board. We've got a Nobel laureate uh, on the board, but uh, the most uh, active uh, member of the board is uh, Yuri Nikolsky, who co-founded Jingo that was sold to Thomson Reuters. And the SAB is chaired by Charles Cantor, the ex-director uh, ex of the Human Genome Project. There were three, as you know. Um, so we are pathway activation specialists, and that's probably going to be the only formula you're going to see today, uh, unlike many other presentations. So we. Um, so, so um, in biology, uh, signaling pathways uh, play a huge role. So we've got uh, major uh, interaction networks 
uh, that uh, have certain biological relevance. Usually it's, uh, um, it's a pathway from a receptor uh, to a large network of proteins that uh, trigger certain events uh, and that interact with each other uh, in certain ways depending on um, uh, the condition the cell is in. So we work on the signaling pathway level and um, uh, experimentally we derived the strength on the interactions between the elements in many signaling pathways. Um, it was uh, two years of uh, work and uh, a lot of um, uh, money spent. So we understand the strength between uh, the interaction of uh, uh, any two elements in the pathway. We understand the role of this uh, uh, element. So for example, that could be a very strong activator or a strong repressor of uh, the downstream protein. Uh, and that's, uh, um, that's how we calculate the pathway activation strength. So we have a topology for every pathway from receptor to transcription pathway or factor. And we have the strength of the interactions of the elements. Um, and we have the activator and repressor role. Um, so basically we can uh, analyze the, uh, whether the uh, pathway is uh, upregulated or downregulated compared to norm. So basically logarithmic case to norm. Uh, beyond the uh, threshold interval, and this W is a very complex uh, uh, value derived for each um, a gene in a uh, specific pathway, uh, multiple HESI matrices. Uh, so we did that for eight pathways uh, using uh, Western blots and phosphorylation assays. That's uh, complex, uh, expensive biomedical ex experiments, and then extrapolated to more, to more than 1,000 pathways. So now we have a pretty good understanding of uh, how to measure activation strength for uh, those pathways. And our modus operandi is that we can compare any two different uh, signaling states. So for example, that could be a biopsy of a healthy patient's uh, um, heart, and uh, that could be uh, a diseased patient's heart. Um, and this could be multiple patients normalized uh, into a single state, uh, and that could be just single patient. So we look at the uh, state transition on the uh, on signaling pathway level, um, and uh, we, for example, here we have uh, just most upregulated to most downregulated pathways uh, differentially, but uh, we have that for uh, more than a thousand pathways. We also have a very large number of drugs uh, with uh, linked to gene expression uh, uh, data uh, before and after incubation of a cell line with a certain drug. So we can uh, design algorithms that negate the effect. So basically uh, simulate a healthy state in a diseased state. That's how we um, score, uh, for example, GERA protectors. So that could be young patient's tissue, uh, old patient's tissue. Our uh, goal is to bring the old patient's tissue as close to the uh, young patient's tissue as possible on a massive population scale and also within population groups using various drug combinations. So that's how we score uh, GERA protectors, for example, drugs that uh, uh, suppress aging or repair age-associated damage. So we have probably one of the largest uh, normalized and harmonized uh, uh, data sets. So we have more than three million uh, um, gene expression uh, uh, samples in the repository from public sources, but also now from private sources. We managed to normalize uh, more than half of those and uh, map them onto signaling pathways and measure activation strength in uh, more than 1.5 million. So that's really big data. Um, so this data set, for example, is around uh, uh, 300 terabytes. Um, we also have our own data from uh, healthy norms. So those are young patients who died in uh, car accidents and motorcycle incidents. Uh, uh, and small samples uh, we're taking from multiple tissues from those patients uh, uh, early post-mortem uh, for analysis. So we understand what's norm. Um, we also have um, uh, 10 uh, GERA protectors that we uh, already validated experimentally, and we believe that four of those uh, are very effective uh, in humans. And uh, uh, one of those 10 is actually a very well-known GERA protector. So we managed to actually predict uh, um, something that's uh, already well, very well known. So um, uh, we're happy about that. Uh, we predicted those about a year ago, didn't publish yet, so we're validating them constantly before we uh, uh, release them to the market. Uh, we, I'm not gonna talk about that, but this is our data factory, so we uh, take data from a variety of sources, uh, put it into a large unstructured database, then we structure it using high-performance computing, using GPU, graphics processing units, 
uh, and uh, then we basically do uh, the same for drug scoring, also using GPU. So uh, one of those machines uh, is um, uh, over 120 teraflops in computing power. Um, so we also moved to deep learning. I'm gonna briefly uh, talk about that. So last November, uh, we started uh, developing our first deep learning algorithms. We partnered with NVIDIA, which is the leader in uh, computer graphics, uh, high performance computing for deep learning. Uh, and um, they gave us their first uh, desktop uh, uh, deep learning uh, machine. So this is a small machine, but it has seven teraflops in computing power. Uh, highly high performance, highly parallel computing uh, solution. Um, we used it for various hackathons and now we managed to use uh, deep learning to recognize uh, drug properties just looking at transcriptomic data. Um, so just a few concepts about deep learning. So it's essentially biologically inspired machine learning and there's a silent revolution going on uh, right now in machine learning. Uh, you probably have heard about uh, Google's acquisition of DeepMind, so they acquired a very small team uh, in the UK after they published their um, uh, results of uh, applying deep learning to playing computer games, so uh, showing that they can teach a machine to uh, learn the rules of uh, many Atari games. They paid 600 something million dollars for that company. Uh, so they use uh, biologically inspired uh, um, uh, neural networks where uh, you basically have um, various nodes uh, representing neurons, and uh, there is math behind it, uh, structured into deep networks. So you've got, uh, uh, let's say for example, uh, this could be a uh, convolutional neural network, deep, 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 deep net, uh, there are many, many uh, implementations of uh, um, deep learning, many flavors. Uh, but essentially you can s show it uh, an image, it will uh, assign weights to the input within the input layer. Uh, that could look at mic mic uh, micro features within uh, the image. Uh, then it will go to another layer that will look at macro features of the, layer, uh, of the <coughs> image. And then it will go into hidden layers of neurons. There can be multiple layers of those. Um, you wouldn't even know what they do. So they uh, intermesh uh, uh, using the various rules that uh, at some point of time you actually stop understanding. And then you have the output layer which classifies uh, uh, the image. Um, and for example, this is how uh, deep learning would be applied to an image. So uh, you uh, extract uh, a certain portion of the picture, uh, analyze it, and let's say it shows that it's a woman. Uh, it's in, white, dress, tennis, racket, green, right? So it's basically, it can also describe um, the image. And uh, so, so one of the uh, last year, um, or actually early last year, uh, Andrew Karpathy from Stanford, he uh, managed to design an algorithm that recognizes images better than humans. Actually not just humans, superhumans who are trained to recognize images. So he trained himself on uh, millions of images uh, to uh, uh, start describing them and then he compared his performance to the algorithm and the algorithm performed better. So. Uh, now uh, algorithms recognize images, videos, uh, and uh, text data uh, much better than uh, humans. Uh, you can actually also describe uh, pictures using deep learning. So when I saw that uh, for the first time, I was just thrilled. So you basically, uh, here, I wouldn't be able to say what uh, this, uh, so I would probably say it's a, it's a trampoline. But here uh, the algorithm is uh, uh, classifying, is uh, describing it as a boy is doing a backflip on a wakeboard, which is pretty cool because there is water in the background. Um, and uh, uh, you train those deep neural nets on huge data. So before huge data, data sets became available, so like ImageNet that stores millions of images with descriptions, that technology was not uh, possible and not imaginable. You probably, so with application of uh, aging, you probably have seen that, right? So that's Microsoft's uh, uh, how old.net, you can upload a picture and it will recognize its age uh, pretty accurately. So you, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So you can upload uh, your picture to how old.net and see if uh, it recognizes it. It recognized my age within a year. Um, it's a deep learned uh, uh, network. So um, you can apply that to uh, gene expression data. So for example, in cancer, if you train a deep uh, neural net using, for example, stacked autoencoders with uh, principal components analysis, 
it will identify a certain tumor. That's so one, two, three, uh, those are various tumor types. So uh, a stacked auto encoder with fine tuning, recognizing a certain tumor with 95% uh, accuracy. Uh, it's already there. So you can train, uh, um, so we use that to recognize age by gene expression data. Um, so you can actually follow our presentation, uh, our publications on ResearchGate. So we published uh, uh, about 40 papers uh, over the past two years. So this paper was published uh, um, last week with uh, Anthony Atala, one of the top names in regenerative medicine. He essentially reconstructed a human bladder using patients' own cells and put it back in the patients. So if there is ever a Nobel Prize awarded to uh, somebody in regenerative medicine, that's gonna be Tony. Uh, so we published uh, the first uh, uh, quality control mechanism for induced pluripotent stem cells uh, using signaling pathway analysis. And basically, I uh, came up with a threshold uh, that um, identifies the, um, ad identifies uh, the embryonic-like properties of stem cells, uh, of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are reprogrammed cells derived from uh, patients' own uh, uh, tissue and reprogrammed uh, to resemble embryonic uh, state. So we can uh, identify, for example, using uh, 18 uh, um, different techniques for deriving uh, <coughs> induced pluripotent stem cells uh, using pathway activation analysis. We uh, developed a threshold, that corridor, that basically that says, okay, this is a bad iPSC, this is a bad iPSC, this is a very good iPSC, it's very close to uh, embryonic stem cells. Um, and uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, those are the uh, stem cells that are pretty, pretty close to therapeutic applications, so they can integrate and become uh, almost any cell of your body, but currently uh, they are cancerogenic, so there is a very high risk of cancer. So if you find a way to do really good quality control of iPSCs, uh, and you can uh, um, really ensure that they, they don't become tumorogenic, uh, you can probably cure a very large number of diseases, including um, CNS diseases. So the way we work with um, uh, pharma, the way we actually make money, uh, we get uh, uh, gene expression data from pharmaceutical companies uh, before and after integration of a, uh, incubation of a cell line with a certain drug, and we give them uh, uh, drug scores uh, for that specific drug in multiple uh, tumor types, the solid tumors, and also in age-related diseases. We also provide them with a very comprehensive report of what the drug does. Uh, we do that to uh, uh, have a solid business model. So we're an aging focused company, but we also work on a variety of diseases to have a sustainable revenue stream, but also to prove that uh, many of our algorithms work. So for every drug, we can uh, identify mechanisms of action, drug resistance, uh, develop a companion biomarker, and uh, show uh, in which diseases that drug can work. So f just to give you an example, those are very popular uh, drugs in oncology by um, uh, target class, so for example, BCR1 inhibitors, EGFRs, and JAKs. Uh, those two drugs uh, generate over $5 billion in revenue for Novartis. They're already in the market. It's one of the major success stories in oncology. It's uh, Gleevec. You probably know that drug. Uh, so we are looking at a repurposing story for uh, those drugs, uh, looking at where uh, and what, what other cancers, besides their main indication, uh, they can be effective in. And here I'm showing just a very small uh, sample of what we can do. We do it for uh, more than 300 diseases. Those are just some of the tumors. So basically here the uh, bad uh, uh, drug score is uh, red, good is green. Uh, we show that uh, imatinib and nilotinib can be very effective in uh, kidney papular, uh, renal papillary cell carcinoma, for example, KPCC. Uh, it has never been tried in those uh, um, tumors and uh, we are predicting a very high drug score. Uh, and we validate those drug scores using retro retrospective clinical trials. So basically we can uh, do a drug score. We don't know that uh, initially because that's actually uh, very difficult to derive. For uh, many uh, drugs, you have to really go and interpret clinical trials and look at the publications to understand uh, whether they failed or not and what kind of data is available. So. Uh, we made those predictions, then compared them to uh, clinical trials, and most of the time, for imatinib, uh, our predictions were correct. So on average, our drug uh, scoring technique uh, in solid tumors is um, almost 80% accurate from what we see from retrospective clinical trials, which is huge for oncology because that's where you have 4% uh, success rate usually in uh, clinical trials. 
uh, for GIFITNIP, a uh, similar story. Um, and what every uh, drug uh, score you make in silico, you actually need to validate somehow. So uh, there is a really interesting company called Champions Oncology. They are operating personalized medicine. They take a uh, patient's tumor, a uh, fresh patient's tumor, expand it ex vivo, so increase the number of cells, put it on a variety of immune-suppressed mice, and then uh, expose those mice to various uh, uh, chemotherapeutic regimens, and then look at what regimen is the most effective for a specific patient. Uh, they're pretty popular, um, re reasonably expensive, but uh, you, uh, as a patient, you probably would want to know what drug is best for you. Uh, every tumor patient is uh, different. So uh, we partnered with them, and uh, we showed that uh, even before uh, we put it on a mouse, we can predict the uh, sensitivity to cetuximab in colorectal uh, cancer patients, and just published uh, um, a paper on that. So our drug scoring is pretty effective. I hope that uh, it will be as effective in uh, uh, identifying geroprotectors, drug that's drugs that work against uh, aging. So that was the first part of my presentation. I tried to rush through the rest of the slides. How many minutes do I have? Oh, oh. Five minutes. Five, uh, can I have seven? <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically what you're looking at here is the history of humanity uh, over the past uh, 600 years. So it took us uh, uh, 400 years for the population to double from half a billion to a billion then 160 years for it to double again, and then uh, 60 years to more than triple to uh, uh, seven, trillion, uh, seven, 7 billion people. Uh, most of the advances in biomedicine came in the past 60 years. So um, we are in that uh, exponential time frame for uh, technology um, advances. This is the new population group as population over 65. Uh, pretty new paradigm. In, uh, and right now we are starting to generate big data, and it's also a very recent uh, uh, paradigm. So uh, in 2015, we will have about eight uh, zettabytes. A uh, zettabyte is uh, one trillion gigabytes um, of data available. And uh, the growth is exponential, and it's not porn anymore. You cannot generate so much porn. Before it used to be, uh, pornography used to be a very big part of uh, big data and big traffic. Now it's genomics. Uh, uh, it's uh, all kinds of uh, biometrics, it's videos, it's uh, uh, social networks. Um, and what's interesting, so my other avocation is I look at biomedical funding trends. So biomedical funding trends are also becoming exponential. So you have a huge increase in biomedical funding from 93. So from five, this is uh, uh, NIH, uh, European Commission, uh, Australia and Canada. So from $5 billion to, uh, over f uh, to almost $50 billion dollars uh, from 93 to 2011. And uh, publications usually uh, go after funding, so you see a huge increase in knowledge. So there are 27 uh, million publications out there, and uh, on, in the database that we track, we have about uh, 3 million biomedical projects, um, about a trillion dollars worth of funding. So also China is now uh, investing even more in biomedicine than uh, the US, so they announced a program for $300 billion uh, to be spent on biomedical research over five years in 2011. Pharma R&D is about $100 billion a year, so total biomedical spending is about $270 billion uh, uh, in 2010. It's a huge amount of money. You will get some biomedical uh, um, longevity dividend. So what's interesting is in biomedicine, this process takes a very long time. So you conceive and describe uh, the idea, it can take you a minute. Uh, then you have to get funding that can take you a year. Uh, then you perform your experiments that could be a year or more. Uh, then you publish your results and patents that's another year or more. Um, uh, then you do your preclinical trials uh, another year or more. Uh, then you go for clinical trials in oncology where it's reasonably fast. It's on average seven years. So and then you have to propagate this drug on the market. So it has to be clinically accepted. And then maybe it will get into prevention. Very uh, rarely it uh, gets into prevention. So uh, in my estimate, about 20 years uh, it takes to get uh, the, mark the, the drug to, a mark to market from the discovery, and 40 years for the Gero protector to re reach the market. So uh, in pharma, there is a huge decline in uh, R&D spending, primarily because this big data that is being generated, uh, about half of that is not reproducible. It's not usable, so it's false. And even in some of the top journals, Nature, uh, uh, Science, etc., a lot of uh, research is not reproducible, and that is contributing to 
uh, a decline in the number of uh, new medical entities by dollars spent uh, uh, in R&D dollars, it's usually billions. So we developed a system called uh, the Aging Research Portfolio uh, that tracks about a trillion dollars worth of funding over the past uh, 25 years and classified it using machine learned uh, learning algorithms into a taxonomy of 360 categories to identify uh, uh, projects uh, early on the grant stage to see if they can be, uh, if, if that's where we can actually trace uh, patterns uh, leading to either success of the project or failure of the project. Um, took data from a variety of sources uh, and now it's a knowledge management system uh, widely used in both aging research and uh, cancer research. So for example, uh, some of the papers that can be generated from that, we can look at uh, very famous uh, genes in uh, uh, aging research that are also involved in many other diseases. Uh, and we can see that, uh, for example, P53, it's a very famous uh, gene, it's a uh, cancer oncogene. Um, Four billion dollars spent on that drug, uh, on that uh, uh, gene, on researching this gene, but it was implicated in, in aging only in uh, 87. So it's not that uh, much time passed, and it's not a very actionable gene. But some of the um, genes, like for example, um, uh, sirtuins. Uh, so let me see. Um, <coughs> So HDAX, for example, uh, implicated in aging 2001, uh, also uh, very famous in, a in aging, just recent. Uh, and uh, for sirtuins, I think it's the next one, no. Uh, so for, s uh, for um, sorry about that. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so for sirtuins, they were discovered in 84, implicated in aging 99. Uh, about 86% of total spending on, this, on those genes were uh, spent on projects related to aging and longevity. That's David Sinclair's work primarily at uh, Harvard and uh, um, uh, other institutions supporting his work. So uh, work on aging is pretty recent. Uh, and uh, there is actually not that much money being spent on uh, aging research. We're talking about 7% of total funding spent on uh, genes that are strongly implicated uh, in uh, uh, aging. Uh, we can also uh, look using that portfolio, using that re resource, uh, we can look at uh, individual scientists' performance, look at how much money they got over their career, their in age index, uh, um, number of publications, amount of uh, money per publication. So those are pretty valuable uh, parameters. You can look at uh, the interactions between those scientists and identify various patterns that lead to success of the project. So usually the more money you get at the grant level, the more successful you are gonna be in the uh, commercial segment. And we, we have uh, many other big data analytical projects that are available for free uh, online, like for example, the aging chart, that's a causality map for aging. I think I'm over time, so I'll uh, rush briefly to uh, the conclusion. Um, sorry. I didn't uh, really expect that it's gonna take so long. So some of the geroprotectors are already on the market, so we probably know about aspirin geroprotective properties and cancer protective properties, metformin, rapamycin. Novartis is already testing a drug called Everolimus in healthy elderly patients as a vaccine potentiating agent. Uh, so in mice, that uh, drug shows significant lifespan increase. And there are many others that you probably don't <laughs> even know. Also, major longevity gains are gonna come from advanced diagnostics, so things like that, which uh, tracks uh, uh, multiple parameters uh, of uh, your health, uh, so you can minimize risk. Uh, there will be a wave of GERA protectors, and there is uh, a huge revolution coming uh, from regenerative medicine. So others, uh, like gene therapy, are not there yet. So the questions uh, that we can ask, uh, as for example, in a trial science, uh, whether we can predict from historical data the probability that the research study will either reach the market, increase longevity, increase produ productive longevity, and uh, appreciate with longevity increases. And now it looks like we um, managed to come close to building that model using approaches like feature extractions uh, from uh, massive data using causal maps, that's Infinity Sciences and Spark Beyond in Israel. Uh, those companies are working on that. Uh, you can do feature extraction using multi-omics uh, data links, linked to drugs and clinical trials, like in Silicon Medicine, us. So in Broad Institute is also very hugely involved in that. And uh, exploring uh, drug sales statistics linked to clinical history. So basically whether 
uh, drug A uh, leads to more consumption and less consumption of drug B. That's Edward de Banel's work. So, uh, yeah, so now we basically are concluding. Uh, we want to propose uh, a creation of a financial instrument coming from big data uh, that will appreciate with longevity increases, contribute to productive longevity, and provide uh, annual, uh, adequate annual return to um, institutional investors uh, based on historic trends. Um, so instead of trying to uh, stash toxic longevity somewhere, you can actually invest in something that uh, advances uh, productive longevity, but also appreciates with uh, um, uh, longevity increases. And we are running a conference in Basel uh, in two weeks uh, called uh, The Practical Applications of Aging Research for Drug Discovery. You're welcome to join. So thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions. So we'll now move to the discussion about all the subject. Maybe, Laura, you want to, to begin? Oh, I'm not Laura, sorry. Uh, the, the, the idea maybe to, 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 to do a link between, uh, let's say, uh, the, the research on one end and how the philosopher can handle the, 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 the issue of longevity. Uh, the idea would be to, 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 to see how uh, in the real world uh, it may impact the, the life of people on one end and the uh, insurers on the other end. I mean, this is something very important because we are talking uh, during all the, 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 the lectures we had we had on one end some demographer and researcher mentioning how we can assess or uh, forecast uh, uh, mortality on one end, and we had some, some um, let's say, um, discussion regarding how we can uh, edge this risk because it's a risk for the for the whole society. And I think this is what you mentioned, uh, Frederic, regarding uh, how to consider big data and longevity. I think you you you. I, I fully uh, agree regarding your, your structure. I think we can consider uh, big data as a way to improve our model on, and, and improve our way to assess longevity on one end, and we can consider uh, um, a big data as a way to improve longevity, and this was def definitely what Alexander showed in, in his presentation. So uh, for, for the first point, uh, as an actuary, I would say that I'm not fully convinced that uh, uh, we will be able to, uh, to improve our, our we will improve our understanding about longevity and assessment. But if we are taking into account longevity, it's a long term, long trend. It means that uh, uh, gathering enough uh, data in order to, to um, uh, expense data, in order to, uh, to do a, a forecast for 60 years or 100 years, uh, I think that we can have all the Internet of Things, all the connected objects, whatever we have, we can have uh, on, on, uh, on real time data, but forecast for, for 60 years with only a couple of days of data, I think this is the, the range of, 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 uh, of uh, track record is not the same. So I fully convinced that the, the big data era, uh, this is mainly a, a data era. And, and, and for, for us, it will be, uh, I mean, for the whole society, it will be really interesting because data will be, will, will be more and more data centric. But I'm not sure that big data will definitely dramatically change the way to assess the longevity on one end. But for the mortality, that is the, 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 the time being, I think we will have more and more access to, um, um, let's say, uh, 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 genetic information, and definitely it will change the way to see the mortality at, at the time being, and maybe at short term to, to estimate the change at short term. So uh, uh, f regarding the improvement, okay, I, I, am, I think this is important to keep in mind that uh, we are talking about big data, but uh, uh, this is the all that are, 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 are not free open. I mean, uh, today we have strong, strong discussion between on one end a view about uh, 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 on data saying that's wonderful, this is a new world, we can in, uh, invent a lot of things, uh, it will be the future, we can have a better understanding about risk and so on. But on the other end, we have all the data protection issues, we have all the data privacy issues, and I think this is something that should take into account because and especially I think that there is a, a big a big gap between the US on one end and the old Europe on the other end uh, because the, the, the rules, the regulation are definitely not the same. The understanding about using data is not the same as well and you should 
we should take into account that what is the purpose, because uh, gathering data, especially in France, means that we have a specific purpose. And specific purpose could be research, uh, could be statistics, but not anything. And this is something that we should keep in mind. Big data could be a, a big advantage for understanding all mortality and longevity, but sooner or later, probably the regulator, because in, in France we have the regulator has a strong impact, but maybe in other countries it will be another way to regulate. Uh, we will have some, uh, maybe some kind of cyclical um, perception about uh, the, the advantage of data in understanding longevity and mortality, because we are talking about something very um, um, uh, uh, personal, uh, the health of people. And I think this, on one end, this is interesting, because if you ask somebody, uh, okay, you will have the, maybe a way to, uh, to live uh, up to 120 years or 150 years, I don't know, that's nice. But if you say you will give your data, but on the other end, maybe you will not have insurance, you will not be covered by the, the pension plan, you will not, and so on, it, it could be a, a, a real issue. So I will uh, I consider this is something that really interesting for the whole society and, and for the actuaries too, and a big challenge. But on the other hand, I will be a bit skeptical and, and very cautious about how we will access data, for what purpose, and uh, and what will be the regulation? Because if we cannot, we cannot uh, regulate ourselves, I think sooner or later, somebody will get regulate the the the, the overall uh, environment. And I think this is now. I think we. I, I try to raise question some some um, ethics uh, issues, and I think this is not my field. <laughs> Definitely not. So this is why uh, I give the floor to the philosopher. <laughs> Bonjour à tous. Euh, je m'excuse tout d'abord de ne pas parler anglais aujourd'hui. La prochaine fois, je m'attellerai à la tâche en parlant anglais. Euh, du coup, ce que je souhaitais dire sur cette problématique, ce que je trouve intéressant, c'est que le philosophe commence toujours par s'intéresser aux mots. Et donc au titre, Big Data et Longévité. Je sais pas. Well, first of all, I apologize for not being able to speak in English. Perhaps next time I'll be ready. Uh, now, I think what's interesting for a philosopher, what we do is the first thing we want to look at is words and the use of words. So I keep hearing today, big data and longevity. Et effectivement, on voit que dans big data, il y a big. On voit effectivement les choses en grand dans notre société aujourd'hui. Et il y a long, longévité. On, on essaye constamment de perdurer. Effectivement, ce sont deux valeurs importantes, la grandeur et durée. So, with big data, big, everything has to be big today. Uh, that's the way society sees things. And long, we want things to last. Alors, ce qui est intéressant avec euh, le big data, c'est que ce n'est pas qu'une innovation technologique, ça ouvre une nouvelle façon de penser le monde, et c'est pour ça que les philosophes ont des choses à en dire. And so, I think what's interesting in big data is not just the technology behind it, but rather the influence that it's going to have on our world view, the way we see the world. Un monde virtuel qui s'appuie sur des faits réels, nos connexions, ce que l'on donne, et qui donc va dire des choses de notre réel, et en l'occurrence, possiblement de notre santé. And so it's a virtual world, a lot of this big data is virtual, and yet it's based on real things, real connections, and it's speaking to us about real physical things, and in particular, our health. Donc effectivement, le big data permet d'anticiper de, des comportements, hein, que ce soit au niveau marchand, économique, mais de pouvoir aussi euh, prédire, comme la médecine prédictive, euh, ce qui en sera possiblement de nous, euh, de notre condition, physique euh, plus tard. And so big data allows us then to anticipate things we can uh, judge uh, how things will evolve. This can be interesting from an economic uh, standpoint uh, of course, but it can also be interesting uh, from our uh, physical standpoint as well. On voit que le, le big data est finalement euh, à l'image de nos politiques et que la politique est aussi à l'image du big data puisque le big data devient un relais. Il exerce ce que Foucault, le philosophe, appelait le biopouvoir. C'est la capacité de pouvoir rassembler des, des données 
sur soi-même, donc sa vie, et de pouvoir donc exercer euh, une attraction, un pouvoir sur cela. Okay. Uh, so, big data also can be reflected in the policies, the image uh, of policy. It becomes a relay in uh, what uh, Foucault called a biopower, i.e. we are gathering uh, data about ourselves and having that data becomes power. Ce qui interroge effectivement la place donc de, de, de la liberté. Si demain, par exemple, euh, comme pour la médecine prédictive, on est capable de dire qu'un individu pourra être porteur ou se voir développer un cancer ou telle pathologie. Si cette personne a un héritage à risque, effectivement, on va lui donner des clés pour pouvoir se guérir, possiblement. Mais si cette personne, le risque finalement des big data, c'est de dépasser la frontière de la maladie et de permettre à tout individu d'avoir des données sur sa propre finitude. Mort. <rire> So what is the question? Then the question arises about our personal freedoms or liberties. So we know that with, thanks to big data, perhaps we will be able to better predict uh, the medical future of a person. We can spot who carries genes that might make them more susceptible uh, to cancer. So on the one hand, uh, this risk can be understood and evaluated and potentially a cure can be found, but at the same time, it goes beyond this consideration and puts us in front of our own finality or death. Alors, euh, ce qui m'intéresse en tant que philosophe, pour être très sincère sur cette thématique, c'est euh, dans quelle mesure le big data peut être aidant. Évidemment, ça pourra euh, permettre de faciliter la prise en charge de certains individus malades, mais aussi va être une tentation pour aller plus loin et pour permettre à des gens de savoir, tout simplement, sans être malade aujourd'hui, qu'est-ce qui pourra se passer dans l'avenir euh, à quel âge ils pourront peut-être mourir ou développer une maladie, une forme de curiosité qui dépasse la maladie. So, for me as a philosopher, I'd say that well, big data is certainly a great help for us in trying to identify cures, but then the temptation from there is to go beyond that. Then will people become obsessed with knowing when they might become sick, when they might die and that's a rather morbid curiosity. Victor Hugo disait « Tout ce qui augmente la liberté augmente la responsabilité. » Si demain, je peux savoir, et un jour peut-être que Big Data nous le permettra, quand ou comment je peux mourir, quelle est ma responsabilité face à ça Est-ce que ça ne va pas nourrir une forme de culpabilité entre ceux qui voudraient savoir et ceux qui ne voudraient pas savoir Et comme uh, Victor Hugo a dit, uh, « Freedom, when there is more freedom, well, responsibility rises at the same time. So if we have that understanding, if we know when we're going to die, how we're going to die, what does this mean in terms of our responsibility? And what does it mean in terms of a, a certain guilt that there might be between the people who want to know and, though, and those who don't want to know and don't know? Finalement, ce que, pour jouer sur les mots, on pourrait dire que euh, si la philosophie invite à la conscience, le big data invite à la méga conscience, à une surconscience, à une extra lucidité possible sur sa vie. And so, if I could couch this in philosophical terms, I'd say that well, philosophy it's a question of the conscience. Uh, big data will lead to a mega conscience or a super knowledge. Et je terminerai en vous racontant une petite histoire, parce que je travaille, je fais de la philosophie dans le milieu médical et qui m'a beaucoup touchée euh, quand je faisais euh, des études encore. C'est justement la question de la médecine prédictive, qui était affiliée à la génétique à la base. Aujourd'hui, on peut l'affilier au numérique. Donc, je vous laisse. Uh, so, just to uh, end with a, with a short uh, anecdote, uh, I've always been very interested in uh, medical uh, studies and in my, in my work I have I've worked in uh, medical uh, contexts uh, and with a particular interest in predictive medicine and genetics and the tie-in with uh, the digital applications. Alors, c'était l'histoire d'une femme justement, puisque la médecine prédictive aujourd'hui lui permettait de savoir si elle développerait ou pas une pathologie, refusait de faire le test. Elle avait la possibilité de savoir 
comme les big data pourraient peut-être permettre, elle avait la possibilité, mais elle ne voulait pas faire le test. Un jour, elle a cédé, elle a fait le test, parce que tout le monde lui disait, mais fais-le, tu peux le, tu peux, tu as les moyens, tu as le moyen de le faire, donc fais-le. Elle a fait le test, et au moment où elle a reçu le test, elle n'a pas voulu avoir le résultat. Et ce que je trouve intéressant, c'est que le big data, effectivement, peut nous amener à avoir envie de savoir ce qu'il en sera plus tard. Et moi, je me dis, rien que le fait de savoir que je pourrais savoir, eh ben, ça me suffit. Je ne sais pas vous. C'est une question ouverte. And so there was a woman who uh, was uh, predicted to be likely to uh, get a certain disease. Um, she didn't want to take the test. Uh, she didn't want to know. But one day, after people kept saying, oh, you should really do the test, you, should, you really should do this, well, she went and had the test done. And then she said she didn't want to know the results. So I think uh, that's uh, sort of the idea here, is big data will allow us uh, to know. And for me, personally, knowing that I could know is enough. I don't necessarily need to know. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, some of you have one uh, question to our speakers. Are you too hungry to go on to? <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, oh, no, uh, oh, excuse me. If you don't clear. Maybe uh, the problem could be also that somebody else knows about us and that we don't know. <laughs> Isn't it that the problem we are facing, uh, if I heard the carefully to the talk uh, of our colleague? Olivier, do you want to, to give an answer? I, I think I, w I fully agree. I think the, the problem of, of talking about, uh, in a couple of minutes, talking about big data and longevity, should we have a kind of collective understanding of big data as far as you have a global information you have a a, a, a big survey a, a, a big study a, a, a upon a, a thousand people and so on uh, with anonym, uh, anonymization and things like that and at the end you have a better understanding about a disease how to cure it uh, the the efficiency of some drugs and so on so far so good The problem is when you are uh, leaving the collective understanding and you are reaching the individual one. When you are, uh, you can access your own, I think today uh, for $1,000, you can have your full sequencing DNA. And maybe in a couple, of, I think the, the price of, of the sequencing, it's uh, getting faster, the, the, the drop of the, of the cost is getting faster than the, the, the more low. So that is, that is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's dividing by, by more than 1,000 every, uh, uh, 1, every 10 years, something like that. So uh, I think this is, that this is incredible. So I fully agree, and this is the, the, the problem is uh, if uh, a, a person knows and he has a, an insurance who have a kind of asymmetry of information, so it's difficult. If um, somebody else knows And, and you don't know that somebody knows about you. And I think as far as you are in the individual sphere, it could be dangerous and it could raise some ethical problems. Thank you. Another question? Okay. So you think it doesn't change uh, it very much? I'm yeah. tremendously impressed by what uh, Alex was describing. Mm. I, I could hardly believe where the world is now. But I still think it's going to be uh, very significant for medical research and for probabilities. But in terms of our individual existential position, I'm not sure it will make a radical difference. 
Yes. Yes, but maybe it's the same question as a collective versus uh, individual point of view. Uh, it's a great interest for a <coughs> um, uh, collective point of view to have more information about uh, what are the reasons of uh, uh, health disease or, or something like that. But uh, it, uh, it's of less interest to have this information of for one person uh, in particular, maybe. Do you want to add something? Sure. Well, uh, not all big data is the same. So uh, when you understand your risks, that's one thing. When you can act on those risks, that's another thing. So for example, for uh, APOE or for many other um, predisposing factors, uh, maybe currently you don't really have much to do about it. That's why genome uh, information, if you, if you sequence your genome, you only are getting the information about your risks and the probabilities. So where we operate is the transcriptome. So that at uh, that, that level, you can actually correct a lot of uh, um, changes using drugs that are very uh, sometimes reasonably safe to use with known effects on gene expression. So in many cases, when you have uh, information on how to act on your risks and correct the uh, pathological uh, either changes or predispositions, uh, I think that's hugely valuable because if I tell you that, for example, I screen many tissues on your body uh, and uh, I tell you that, okay, there, there is a geroprotective regimen that will keep you um, alive and also well, uh, and unless you get cognitive de decline, you are, you're still going to enjoy life, right? Because nowadays it's so data-driven, so beautiful to live even if you uh, can't function as, uh, as well because it's, uh, it's information that you get pleasure from now. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure you would want to know and you probably would want to get that uh, geroprotective uh, regimen. And for example, in uh, Dr. Lee's uh, case, uh, uh, despite any uh, age differences, he looks more vibrant than anybody in the room, right? Some of the, some of the presentations were just so spectacular and uh, uh, engaging that uh, uh, you probably would want to have people like you around, you know, 100 years uh, from now. So uh, knowing the risks and knowing the ability to uh, change some of the pathological uh, differences between young and old states, that's very valuable. 